Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We're going to continue on with this week's theme, exploring the genre of jazz, and I think we have another uh, difficult track ahead of us, much like Tuesday's is Charles Mingus track that we checked out. This one is from a band called Sun Ra, uh, also filed under Sun Ra and his ar- orchestra. Uh, at least that's how Apple has it, but everybody who's requested it has just called it Sun Ra. So, not quite sure where that lands. Uh, this comes off of the Jazz in Silhouette album, and we're looking at the closer titled Blues at Midnight. Let's see what Sun Ra's bringing to the table today. That is quite a quick pace. Really interesting so far to feature the piano and bass so prominently before the horns came in at all. Interesting stuff coming out of our rhythm section. to pay attention to the primary sounds you hear out of the drum kit in this track. Yeah, primarily cymbal work with sparse bass kick and snare. It is one of the major things that separates jazz drumming from rock drumming. Oh. 
funky stuff coming out of our piano. Real fun ideas. Uh, <laughs> nice little motif there. Yeah! So we've actually had some really strong melodic soloists so far, but I love this. <laughs> There's a real playfulness with this soloist. I think this is the first time we've heard flute all week. Yeah, hearing the piano pick up on that repeated T note, the flute was dropping.
<laughs> okay. This is some smooth bell playing. Okay, okay. Interesting. So that didn't follow the standard AABA format. That was more like BA, where the B was ninety-five percent of the track. We it was most we started in the solo section. Uh, we introduced the rhythmic or the rhythm sections ideas slowly. Um, but I don't really feel like we explored any melodic horn component uh, to the song that would be a group melody like we got there at the end until the end. We slowly faded in the rhythm section, started kicking off solos. We soloed for 11 minutes and then had a nice little conjoined lick at the end. Very interesting way to go about doing that. Um... Definitely a way to kick off the end of a of an album, though. I'm really glad we got around to checking this one out because it provides... Well, I kind of wish we had checked it out tomorrow. I think it's a fantastic way to wrap up the week. But it provides a nuanced look at a lot of different soloing styles. Primarily because we had seven soloists on this track. Maybe eight. Um... And I think it's a, a real strong wrap-up of a lot of the things jazz can be, especially, in this case, improvisational jazz. Uh, we had some really strong melodic style, especially, um, what was it, our opening tenor soloist was a soloist number two, I think it was. Um, really strong melodic style. Every idea flowed into the next. It was all about crafting that linear story from start to finish and taking the listener on, uh, you know, on a, on a, a narrative. Telling a story about, you know, how they were feeling or, or whatever and what kind of mindset they were in and having this really beautiful flowing concept. But then we also had uh, people like the trumpet player who was kind of just all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> even starting out outside of the key, which was very neat. I don't think it would have worked as well in isolation, but given we had, is it five soloists prior to the trumpet player coming in, uh, primarily sitting within the key, occasionally borrowing some notes outside, but, you know, being very harmonically consonant. 
the trumpet player coming in with a couple of what sound like wrong notes, I think was a phenomenal way to stand out a bit from everyone else. Uh, but the trumpet player was really, really great at uh, moderately utilizing uh, uh, dissonance elements to create an evocative solo that stands out very much from its peers uh, and the rest of the track. Uh, so that was kind of neat. We had a bit more dissonance from everybody else's consonants. Um, we also had instruments like the... It was a lot of soloing. I'm trying to remember who did what here. Um, and I can't remember the timbre on it. That would really help narrow things down. But it was closer to the end. It was either the trombone or the flute. Um... I don't remember now. Anyways, one of them was just really leaning into licks and motifs and modulations on ideas. And it was a series of variations, which the rhythm section was keen to pick up on and lean into as well. Very cool when you hear a rhythm get repeated over and over by an instrument and the drums pick up on it or a note is consistently returned to on the downbeat of every other bar or something like that and the piano picks up on it and leans into it it's those little bit of uh, back and forth communications that arise from improvisational music like this that always stands out to me as one of the strong aspects of uh, improvisational work and that kind of leads into jazz because there's very few other genres that are exclusively well not exclusively that are so heavily focus on improvisational composition. Um, so I tend to attribute this very big, uh, very much to, to jazz, but I love how you get these little moments where you can have these back and forths on the fly, something you would never hear in another performance if it weren't recorded. You know, you go see a live jazz performance and you can hear a brand new conversation that no one else is ever going to get to hear. And uh, it's just, it's really cool. I wish, I wish more music would utilize improvisational music in this way. I think jam bands do a lot of imp improvising. I don't have hard statistics for that. Jam bands have a lot of meandering solo sections. I don't know how much of it's pre-composed. I guess it depends on the band, but... Uh, in my experience, though, with that style of rock, there just tends to be more of the drums and the bass and whatever. They're just going to keep doing what they're doing. And the, you know, solo guitar or whatever is going to solo. And it's sort of the separation between the two. You have the soloist and the background music. And jazz isn't that way, especially when you have a group that has that sort of chemistry and, and uh, synergy together where they can you know, pick up on things. They start to see patterns in people's playing and they can lean into them, right? It's almost expected that a good rhythm section is going to participate in the solo section aside from their own solos. Um, and it's just not an expectation I have in other styles of improvisational work. Um, so I really liked how we could hear that here as well. So not only did that instrument give us the... Uh, you know, the lick-based style of soloing that contrasts with more of the melodic, flowy kind of stuff, but we also got to hear some of the ways that the rhythm section could participate in the soloing element with the soloist. Um, like I said, this is just a really great, what I say, an end-of-the-week wrap-up. I wish this was Friday, because I do think that this covers a lot of the jazz we haven't heard so far. Um, also, it's very upbeat jazz that is um, also improv. Like some of the stuff we heard with uh, Mingus on Tuesday was a bit faster, but I think a lot of that was pre-composed. Um, so with this one, we're getting some of the, uh, the double time swing, but a lot of it, not like 90% of it is, uh, is improvised. So you really get to hear some of these people at the height of their skill, really pushing their on-the-fly composition. Um, and, you know, not really missing a beat. I wouldn't say any of these solos were lackluster in any way. 
tons of skill on display here. Now this brings us to our rhythm section. This is what opened the song, what closed the song, and what was consistent throughout. The bassist is ridiculously skilled. <laughs> um, for anybody who hasn't played jazz bass, a lot of it is called walking the bass line. It's groupings of rising and falling notes that showcase the chord you're in. It's not always arpeggiations. It's uh, there are there is a standard uh, format that you can kind of follow if you want. This bassist was doing his own thing, which is very cool. Uh, some of the notes were in the more standard format. Some of them were arpeggiations, but not all of them were. It's just consistently showcasing the strengths of each chord that we were in. But it's played at such a fast pace. They're quarter notes. Um, but there's so many chord changes in here as well. Played at such a fast pace and having to keep this moving going on. It's uh, it's an endurance test. It really is. And the basses did not miss a single beat. Just a, a robot over there on, on the bass. Phenomenal stuff. Um... The drums, I wanted people to look at real real quick, um, one of the opening solos, I, I told you to key into what the drums were doing. This is one of the huge differentiations between rock and jazz. One is the intensity. Rock is all about hitting things as hard as you can. Jazz is about elegance. If you ever watch a jazz drummer, there might be some arm movements, but a lot of it is going to be wrist movements. It's about a lighter, more finessed drumming style. And with that comes a reduction of harsh attacks. Our toms, our bass kicks, our snares all have loud cracks to them. They want to be used as sparingly as possible. You want the elegance, especially in something like swing or up-tempo swing, or double-time swing, um, you're going to want the elegance, that lightness of cymbal work, which is why there's so much cymbal work in here. It's also what primarily drives the groove. The bass kick and snare are used sparingly to accent specific hits to, for the crack to mean something, right? It's the opposite of a blast beat, where the, the consistency of the harsh attack is there to remove any sort of accent. Here, it, the power of these harsher attacks are used to have weight, right? If you use the snare all the time, that's just the sound of the drum kit. But if you use it rarely, it is now a contrasting timbre. It is a loud hit that stands apart from everything else that happens. It signifies importance to that beat. So yeah, just a really great moment to uh, kind of showcase how jazz drumming is different than rock, rock drumming, even though they use the same tools. Um, and this brings us to the piano, which I have the most questions about, but also I'm the most enthused to, to talk about. The piano was, um, okay, so I, I'm pretty sure I brought this up, but for those who don't watch every single video, and I don't blame you, I put out a lot of stuff, in the jazz rhythm section, the bass is both a rhythmic leader and a chordal leader. They are so much of the foundation of jazz comes from the bass. In a lot of rock, pop, folk, whatever, <laughs> pretty much any mainstream music, the piano plays chords. They are what define the chordal structure of a song. But when that role is given to the bass and lead melodic roles are given to the horns, where does that leave the piano? And it's a really interesting place because the piano gets to do a lot of things. It's sort of the jack of all trades. It's the wild card in the jazz bands. And here, they chose for the pianist to 
introduce bizarre chords constantly. It almost felt like, uh, you know, the conductor or the composer or, you know, Sun Ra, is that, that's a person, right? I'm going to assume it says Sun Ra and his orchestra. As if Sun Ra, or maybe he is the pianist, but informs the pianist, you know, I'm not going to give you any sheet music. Just uh, play what you feel. <laughs> And sometimes it is a bit more harmonious. But often I heard a lot of really interesting dissonance coming out of the piano, which gave the entire song a very cool texture. It wasn't an overbearing dissonance. It wasn't really digging into harsh opposition. It was more of a, a light abrasion. And given the volume... It also meant that it was ignorable for the most part. Which means it's just this nice little background texture that when you key into it, you're like, oh, that's, ooh, that's spicy. But if you're not actively listening to it, you just kind of get this nice extra grit to the overall sound of the song. It's a really neat idea. I don't know if it always worked. As with a lot of jazz, and especially improvisational jazz, you're going to get some flukes. You're going to get some duds. Not everything's going to be perfect. Um, and I'm going to assume that this was close to perfect, given that it was recorded, but also it was 59. So I think this would have been recorded on tape, possibly, and in one take, which means that if the piano... If somebody didn't like the piano part, everybody would have to redo the entire song. So I don't know how much of the piano part is fine, or how much of it is perfectly as intended, if that makes sense. But it's interesting how often it decides to err on the side of, of dissonance and just to bring in these very spicy tones... So what's going on around it? And sometimes it works. When it plays off against that trumpet, that section is marvelous. And the pianist doesn't always lean into it either. When it begins to play off of, like I said, either the trombone or the flute. Can't remember who was doing it there at the end. But when they decide to play off of their solo and participate and have this back and forth, they move towards more consonant tones to line up with what the soloist is doing. But a lot of the time I'm like, oh, so what's the piano up to right now? Ooh, ah. Gee, those are weird. <laughs> Let's go check out the soloist again. Um, it's interesting because everybody else is in key. For the most part, like I said, you can always solo and borrow some notes from outside the key, but nobody here is really pushing against the chord progression except the pianist. Uh, and it's just a really interesting texture to bring it to, to uh, the track. Um, and I guess that brings us to the end which was um, a nice little idea there. I don't really know that much of it meant much to me. This was just a really fun exercise in improv. The final section felt more of like, well, we can't just finish the song on a drum solo, so let's bring everybody together for you know a 16-bar group idea. And it started out pretty neat because there was uh, layered melodic lines. The saxophones and the brass were doing two different ideas, but that lasted for, I don't know, four bars maybe before they lined up and were, everybody was pretty much doing the same thing. It's, um, melodically, it was nice. I have nothing against what was actually written for the part, but it feels a little uninspired with the unification of everything, especially starting it off with that really nice split. So... <clears throat> I don't know. Like I said, it's it's functional. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the ending. It just feels uh, a little bit missing. But maybe it's a callback to something else on the album. We are looking at the final 12 minutes of a 45-minute album, and it's possible that this wraps up the album as a whole more so than it wraps up the song. So, you know, it's hard to uh, it's hard to properly talk about album closers. <laughs> Uh, because they have two roles, 
they not only have to be their self, but they also need to wrap up a, a whole experience. So, yeah, I think I'm just going to leave it at that. It was functional, but felt like it could have been more. But maybe it was exactly what it needed to be for the larger context of the album. All right, you know, I was I was going back and forth. Do I need to talk about the, the drum solo? Yes, let's talk about the drum solo real quick. Um... I really like this because this is a good showcase of a pretty typical jazz drum solo. If you've ever gone to a rock concert and the drummer gets 5-10 minutes to show off, it is a flurry of consistent, constant hits. It's all about putting as many notes together as you can. And there's certainly something impressive about it. And especially in the moment with the energy of the show, it is a phenomenal thing to experience but my personal taste in music it's not something I'm going to go out of my way to listen to as usual I want something with a little bit better pacing and melodic writing to it and it's probably informed by my listening to jazz drum solos this might seem a little undercooked for somebody used to rock or metal drum solos but this is exactly what I love it is sparse. It is comprised of these little pockets of notes, much like the horn solos. Their restriction, though, is air. They have to breathe, so there is going to be breaks in their solo. But it also, I don't know if jazz was built around that and everything took part, or maybe that was a byproduct of jazz. I don't know. But drumming took that same idea and say, well, if they're going to phrase their work, I'm going to phrase my work. And that's where we get some of these really cool ideas in the drumming that feels more like playing a musical, in or sorry, a pitched instrument, more so than a percussive one, uh, where you can almost hear a series of notes out of the drumming complete with pauses, with rests. The drummer doesn't need to rest, but they do anyways to create a breathing right? And in and out of their solo to provide a pacing to it. Um, and it was just phenomenal. Mixed in with the fact that there is plenty of motifs and variations on said motifs, it was just an exceptional drum solo with plenty of playfulness to it that showcased both expertise in composition, expertise in musicianship, and uh, a little bit of tongue-in-cheek, having fun with it. Right? It's not just about the seriousness of the solo, but the drummer enjoyed it and had fun with it as well. Um, just 10 out of 10 as far as drum solos go for me. Everything that I ask for is there. Or I should say everything that I enjoy out of it is there. Um, which does lead us to our other percussion solo, which I was not expecting. I thought this was going to end the song. Bells. First of all, they're exceptionally clean. At times, it almost sounded like hanging bells, um, like the chimes that are different um, different lengths, and you just run your hand across it, and you get that magical kind of sound, right? It almost sounded like those, but it definitely had the attack. Well, it had a, had a very soft attack, almost like that. But uh, the way that notes were being individually targeted, it definitely sounds to me like it's some sort of um, marimba or xylophone, definitely something in that area, or sorry, glockenspiel, uh, some sort of uh, bell setup laid out like a keyboard hit with mallets. But the attacks were so soft. I wonder how, what kind of mallets they were utilizing because these attacks were just, it was almost like a legato style. It was phenomenal. Um, it's just such clean playing. But the song's called Blues at Midnight in this section, complete with the fact that the uh, rhythm section had come down in volume to facilitate this quieter instrument, sounded like stars at midnight. I really thought they were going to in the, end the track here. Um, but they didn't, they went into the outro, which like I said, I, I didn't have as strong of a connection with, so that was just an interesting choice, but I really love the inclusion here. Much like the flute, we don't hear bells often in 
jazz. They certainly are there. They're just not as predominant of an instrument. And it was really nice to hear both of them here, especially given the theme blues at midnight. I think both of them have more of that starry brightness to them that uh, fit really well with that concept. Those are my thoughts on Sun Ra's Blues at Midnight. This is where y'all come in. Hit me up in the comments. Let me know what you thought of this track, anything that stood out, anything you'd like to add on to what I said or correct me on. Above the comment section is a description box, and there's a link for Linktree. It takes you to this menu right here. It has links for everything related to the channel. You can find multiple ways to support the channel, a link to get to the Discord community, ways to email me, check out the music I've made, and so much more. Go ahead and check it out. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. All right, we have a special selection as well today. Otherwise, we'll be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 p.m. UTC as usual. We're going to check out our final jazz track and look at some creator requests for the week. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you choose to watch my videos.